Um, and I, I fear that one or two people may have taken their time over tea and may trickle in even uh, over the next five minutes, but I really would like to get a, um, get a start, make a start. Um, we've only got two papers, rather than three, so that means we have time to expand and to uh, listen to our two speakers and plenty of time, I hope, for questions, discussion, yeah. comment. So it's, uh, we're going to go in the order in which uh, the, the speakers appear on the program. So Ronnie Mosin first, and uh, Gala Al Rashid uh, second. And I think many, anybody really who works on Pakistan will, or lives in Pakistan, or is from Pakistan, will know the uh, writings of Moni Mosin. She's been writing in the Friday Times since it began. Uh, pretty much. Pretty yes. much since it began, uh, with those wonderful light satires that yet at the same time have very <laughs> deep meanings and very deep <laughs> critique of what's been going on at the uh, level of the English in Pakistan um, over those the years of uh, probably not Zia ul Haq, but no, no, the, the, the paper only actually came into being the day General Zia died. Ah, we yes. put in our application because yeah. in his time we couldn't get it. We couldn't, of course, mm -hmm. do that. That's right. Mm -hmm. So uh, Benazir Bhutto and then uh, Nawaz Sharif and, and then uh, Benazir Bhutto. Imran Khan, uh, not as a <laughs> prime minister, but <laughs> very much dominant in the scene. So. Um, Moni uh, Mosin has a, uh, it's also uh, published uh, books, novels, uh, as well as that. And we're very much looking forward to hearing her reflect on her experience as a, as a writer, as a satire, what it is that satire can do. Because satire goes and back thousands do. of years. And can't do. Yes, I can't. So, I'm Thank you, thank you very much. I have been um, advised to stand here, so I will. <coughs> um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to listen to so many interesting papers. Um, and I also want to thank the, thank the Institute for inviting me, also to get a chance to communicate with you. So <coughs> my column is called um, The Diary of a Social Butterfly. And it's been running for 20 odd years. And it is in the, narrated in the voice of a Pakistani socialite. She's upper class, she's wealthy, she's cloistered. She um, is uh, ferociously um, competitive. Uh, she wants what everybody else has and a little bit more. Um, she is politically slightly naive <coughs> and unschooled. But at the same time, she somehow or the other manages to hit the nail on the head about what is actually happening in Pakistan. And she's a witness to everything that has happened since um, 19, early 1990s when I started writing this column. But she's a slightly unreliable narrator, so you have to sift what she says. Anyway, so I will first tell you a little bit um, about what it means to be a satirist in Pakistan and what our challenges are. And then I will read to you uh, a short excerpt from my um, book. So when I sent my collected satirical columns, <coughs> The Diary of a Social Butterfly, to a publisher in India, she snapped it up. Later, she said to me, I expected this to come out of India, not out of Pakistan. <laughs> so those who know Pakistan only from the grim headlines that it regularly generates, you can't think that there's much scope for humor there. But in fact, Pakistanis have a long tradition of laughing at themselves. Urdu literature is replete with first-rate satirists. Akbar al Abadi, Ibn Insha, Mushtaq Yusufi, Patras Bukhari. And then we have people called Bharns. I'm sure they're sort of there are equivalents in the Arab world as well. But they are traditional performers who entertain at weddings or at gatherings, etc., with really fast and furious monologues of cutting political commentary. They are they're really widely loved, as are mimics who are stars and country's finest impersonators um, in, in um, both Karachi and Lahore have their own television shows. So humor is much, much, much loved in Pakistan. Mm. And humor directed at oneself. So television from the start was a medium that lent itself to the propagation of humor and satire. In the 1970s, there were two excellent satirical shows called Akkar Bakkar and Tal Matol, which lampooned not just the rich and the silly, but also political elites. Today, there are three separate satirical programs on GEO, the biggest and most watched independent television channel, where politicians come in for a regular drubbing. Dunya Television has a program called Ham Sab Umeed Se Hai, which means we're all expecting known for its biting political commentary. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the Friday Times, a weekly paper from Lahore, for which I also write, has published a series of fictitious satirical diaries over the years. Mm -hmm. Dear Diary by Benazir Bhutto, 
اتفاق نامه بین نواز شریف تو کارل پرایم منیستر موش اند بوش تلفن کانورسیشن بیتوین جنرل مشرف اند پریزیڈنٹ بوش ہاؤز ایٹ بائی ام دا ڈیم عمران خان آل ریٹن بائی دا پبلشر جگنو واسن ہو ہیپنس ٹو بی مائی سسٹر سو سبورسف کارٹون از سچ اے ساور نظر اینڈ فائکا اینڈ زہور اینڈ جاوید اقبال ہوز ورک از پبلشڈ ان لیڈنگ نیشنل نیوز پیپرز ہاؤس ہولڈ نیمس بٹ اینڈ اٹس اے ویری بگ بٹ But if the purpose of satire is to speak truth to power, then satire is conspicuous by its absence from Pakistan. But the fact is that neither politicians nor the chattering classes wield any real political power in Pakistan. The real power brokers are the army and the religious establishment. The Pakistan army is a fearsome entity. It has ruled over the country directly for over half its 70-year history and indirectly for the other half. It's a bit like the Egyptian army. <laughs> so with vast financial resources at its disposal, it owns the country's mightiest industrial complex and is its biggest landowner, the single biggest landowner. It makes and breaks political parties at will. It dictates foreign policy and controls public discourse through manipulation of school curricula and the media through a combination of bribes and intimidation. It is the military that controls Pakistan's nuclear arsenal and directs the doctrine of national security, tolerating little oversight from a democratically elected government. Its intelligence wing, which is the inter-services intelligence, is liaises directly with non-state actors, which are extremist militias, and deploys them to execute its foreign policy objectives in neighboring countries. Again, without the knowledge, let alone the agreement of the civilian government. Peddling a highly charged nationalist narrative, it has over the years positioned itself as the preeminent guardian of the state of Pakistan. Never mind that it's lost all four wars it has ever fought with its arch enemy India. To criticize or ridicule the army is therefore to ridicule the state of Pakistan, which is tantamount to treason. The other sacred cow is the religious establishment. Forty years ago, before General Ziaul Haq brought in an Islamization, Islamizing agenda through a military coup, mullahs were figure of fun, figures of fun who were regularly mocked for their gargantuan appetites and for their rank ignorance, but no longer. These days, they are not referred to as Maulvis, casual Urdu word for them, but as, but as alim deen scholars of faith, which is a respectful Arab term. With television shows of their own, they have the clout and charisma of genuine celebrities, and with legions of foot soldiers at their beck and call, they have the power to bring violent mobs numbering tens of thousands onto the streets at a moment's notice. Ironically, for a religion that has no provision for clergy, they now opine on every aspect of our religious and social lives, starting from how women must comport themselves, to how we may or may not raise our children, when and where we can pray, what, or what we may or may not read, what we can or cannot eat, what we can or cannot watch, what we can or cannot hear, what we can or cannot play. Much like the military is the guardian of our national integrity, so the mullahs are the wardens of our religious lives. An attack on the re religious establishment is seen as an attack on Islam itself. In Pakistan, blasphemy is punishable by death. Five years ago, Salman Taseer, who was the governor of Punjab, Pakistan's most populous province, was gunned down in broad daylight in a public venue by his own security guard for proposing a review of the law. For those of you who don't know how this happened, he had gone to a restaurant and when he was walking out, he had a, a, a military entail which looked after him, kind of posse of guards, all standing there. And this man had already told them that I want to kill him today. So he walked up to him and he riddled Salman um, Tasir with bullets while they all stood by and watched. They, all, they were all armed and they all stood by and watched. So consequently, there is a very real climate of fear and unaccountability in Pakistan. Violence is rife and a wrong word or a strongly voiced opinion can land you with a bullet in the head. Last year alone, 29 journalists were killed in Pakistan. So to ridicule the military or mullahs requires great courage. It is widely understood that to do so is to court death at the hands of non-state actors. Because both the army and the mullahs have direct links with um, militias. Therefore, most satirists tend to satisfy themselves instead with digs at politicians or liberal elites, 
or else that fail safe punching bag women. Nonetheless, some recent cases stand out. Mohammed Hanif's satirical novel, A Case of Exploding Mangoes, savagely parodied General Ziaul Haq and his inner coterie. And what's more, he got away with it. In my opinion, the army let it pass because it mocked an individual, a long dead one at that, and not the institution itself. Further, it was a novel written in English, which limited its appeal to a small select audience within Pakistan. The national language is Urdu, very few people speak or re read English. In fact, as Hanif has quipped, after the book's publication, he was even approached by retired army personnel at social gatherings and taken aside and asked, son, who's your source? <laughs> so <they're both> <laughs> <laughs> the members of the Gheret Brigade, which is the Dishonorable Brigade, um, it's, it's a group of musicians, received a less tolerant response when their excoriating Urdu song, Alu Ande, which means potatoes and eggs, was released in 2011 after Salman Tassif's assassination. It took aim squarely at social hypocrisy, where Nobel laureates are erased from public memory because they belong to minority sects, and murderers like Mumtaz Qadri, mm -hmm. Salman Tassif's killer, mm -hmm. and Ajmal Kassab, one of the terrorists who, were attacked, who attacked Mumbai, are lauded as heroes. The song also took on the then serving army, general, general, uh, serving army chief, General Kayani, as well as religious figures of note. The song was released on YouTube and went viral and was swiftly taken down. Their follow-up single, Dhinak Dhinak, again mocked the army, was released in 2013 and promptly blocked again on Vimeo. No terrestrial television channel would air it. When Saad Haroon, another young singer, released a parody of the song Pretty Woman, calling his version Burka Woman, <laughs> he earned the wrath of the mullahs. Bloggers demanded that he be stoned to death while other Islamists complain, and this is a very, very sort of particular and favorite complaint, that he had encouraged the West to laugh at them. <laughs> while his song received thousands of hits on YouTube, he was also inundated by emails containing death threats. Faris Shafi, another young rapper who had his song Muskura, which means smile, attacking the corruption of army generals banned. Cartoonists have fared little better, when Mohammed Zahoor, one of the country's best-known cartoonists, drew a, series of drew a series lampooning terrorist networks, hinting slyly at their army connections, he began receiving visits from a group of clean-shaven men. Now, this, this thing, you know, when you say group of clean-shaven men, it means the ISI. Um, we can't name them. That's the level of fear. You can't even name the army. You always call them either the deep state or the establishment mm -hmm. or boots. <laughs> something like that. Anyway, um, so he received this visit from these clean-shaven men who urged him to reconsider his actions. Consequently, when Osama bin Laden was discovered and killed in Aktabad, no humorist, no satirist commented on what could have been a golden opportunity to poke fun at the army's incompetence or else its ignorance depending which side you took. But no one did. Humiliated before the world, the generals were in no mood then to tolerate ridicule from their own people. So we satirists have internalized the ever-present threat and learned to censor ourselves. We have learned to pick our fights, to be strategic, to mock carefully. When I worked full-time at the Friday Times, I once wanted to write a humorous column exploring the rewards promised to virtuous Muslim women in paradise. <laughs> While men dallied with 72 virgins on velvet rugs and perfumed glades, women, I asked, were they to be rewarded with their husbands all over again? <laughs> <laughs> My editor refused to let me run the article. He said it wasn't worth it to risk the ire of the mullahs for a humorous rumination. Any exploration, however harmless, of any verse of the Quran could be deemed blasphemous and was therefore strictly off bounds. My long-running column, The Diary of a Social Butterfly, is ostensibly about the excesses of the rich elites. Using the literary device of a first-person narrator, I appear to be laughing at my own character's foolishness, her weakness for conspicuous consumption, and her fierce pursuit of social one-upmanship. In doing so, I aim to disarm my critics so that I may slip in sharp social and political barbs in the guise of self-deprecation. In the diary, I have ridiculed religious hypocrisy and the army's massive financial corruption. I have mocked the Arabization of Pakistani culture 
and slammed sec sectarian extremist outfits, who she keeps calling weirdo weirdos. Thus far, I am pleased to report I have not received any visits from clean shaven men, <laughs> or even bearded ones, or received death threats on social media for my work. But there's always tomorrow. <laughs> I suspect the fact that I write in English and publish in newspapers for a select few has kept me safely below the radar. But writing the diary has helped me express my dissent and channel my anger into something which I hope will be productive. Even if it does not trigger social or political change, which is the secret desire of all satirists, at least I can derive some comfort from the fact that I have made people laugh and hopefully to reflect. And now, with your permission, I want to read you a small excerpt from my diary so you can see how oblique we have to be and to what, how carefully we have to judge it. So, as many of you may remember, in September 2012, there was a film made by an American called Innocence of Muslims, which was released on YouTube. Predictably, it offended Muslims all around the world, and they protested in no uncertain fashion. But Pakistan was the only Muslim nation where a holiday was declared in protest. <laughs> and angry demonstrations under the banner of Love Our Prophet took place all across the country. Now, as you remember, I may have, um, as you may remember, I mentioned the fact that you know the religious parties can mobilize people very quickly and, and huge amounts of people. So this day was observed on the 12th of September, 2012, and the public holiday saw a crowd of 15,000 people in Karachi set alight. Oh yes, and whenever there is something which is which a perceived slight or offense from the West be it America or anywhere, <coughs> the Danish cartoons or whatever, the reaction of the people is to go and set light their own, you know, things in their own country, to destroy things in their own country. <laughs> so, <coughs> I, but, but, they, but they target mainly things which are seen to be, or, or places which are seen to be Western or American or whatever. So KFC is always a, a place. <laughs> 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 McDonald's is, is the most favorite. KFC even less because they like chicken. But McDonald's <laughs> is always, always sort of um, um, hit upon. <laughs> and then, then cinemas, for some reason, I mean, considering they're showing Bollywood films, but still cinemas are seen as somehow or the other purveyors of Western decadence, you know. So, so cinemas are also burnt always. So on this occasion, on the 12th of September, they set alight six cinemas, two banks, probably Citibank or Bank of America or something, <laughs> a KFC and five police vehicles. Al Jazeera News reported that 15 people were killed in Karachi that day, two of whom were policemen. In an unrelated development, around the same time, Kate Middleton was on holiday in Provence, in France with Prince William, and she was staying in this very private, secluded villa um, and there was a swimming pool there and she was sunbathing topless. And a photographer took a photograph from, I don't know, half a mile away with very powerful lens. And um, the photographs were published in a French tabloid, which then Prince William sued. So this is what I had to say about that in the column. September 2012, Diary of a Social Butterfly. That Prince William, he has turned out to be such a wimp. <laughs> Just look at him. This trashy French magazine prints topless photos of his wife, Kate, middle class. And what does he do? He sues the paper. I mean, what kind of wimp is that, yeah? <laughs> he should take a leap out of our mullah's handbooks and go straight away to the French embassy in London and set fire to it. <laughs> <laughs> and if he can't burn down the embassy, at least you should burn some French restaurants. Have some shame, yeah. If you don't burn any French restaurants, then you should go straight to Harrods and burn down the Chanel makeup counter and beat up all the girls who are serving behind it. Never mind if they're English or Polish or God forbid even Pakistani. Serves them right but for being servants of the French bloody traitors. <laughs> I think so. Prince William should also burn tires in front of Selfridges. <laughs> and Harvey Nichols for stocking Dior and Chanel and YSL and all those other stupid, stupid type French brands. You should also stop anyone driving a Renault or a, <laughs> or a Citroen and drag them out and beat them up. <laughs> you should also beat up all the children in Britain who are studying French in school <laughs> and set fire to their textbooks. Bloody <laughs> hell, you should change the curriculum. You should ban French. Instead of which, he's suing a bloody magazine. I mean, for God's sake, what is he? A man or a mouse? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.
for that insightful <laughs> talk, but delivered in such a wonderful way. <laughs> and um, I'll, I'll move straight on to Gada Roshi. Are you a satirist or an observer of satire? Observer. Observer of <laughs> Not satire. Not a satirist at all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll have some interesting comparative discussions, I think, at the end. And you're talking on proposing a different yeah, community than the imaginary satire in the Egyptian revolution. Uh, so the story, I believe, is familiar to many in here. Um, in December 2010, the Tunisian Jasmine Revolution started, and a chain of Middle Eastern and <coughs> North African uprisings followed it. Mass protests happened in Egypt and in a succession of Arab states, including Syria, Yemen, Bahrain, and Libya. In attempts to understand the Arab upsurge, many Western commentators, experts, and academics <coughs> have proposed a new communication technology it actually played a role in propelling, invigorating, or coordinating the movements. They refer to cyberspace in order to explain this essential rise um, uh, of, of resistance, or this escalating rise, actually, of resistance. This, of course, <coughs> means that Western expert discourses have not developed diverse ways to conceptualize the movements. Conversations on the role of new communication technology in the many movements took different forms and hinged upon different understandings of how new media could, inter uh, could interact with politics. For example, there was um, what would be described as a transcendental <coughs> way of speaking yeah. about technology, underlying a proportion of discussions surrounding the many movements. In conversations shaped by this model, new communication technologies mm -hmm. are understood as entities capable of transcending the limitations, the limitation of space, the limitation of time, the limitations of politics, and are presented as eruptive force in the region, overcoming obstacles, uniting the people, uniting the, the people of MENA with the globe. Um, so it has this transcend transcendental promises to it. And then another approach to the interaction between new media and movement was based on the presumed capacity of technological innovation, not to transcend, but to facilitate a network, which means that the assumption that technology doesn't have substantive <coughs> force in itself, but it depends on its usage. The problem with this epistemological model, that the network, which is the networking under the network understanding of technology, is that it assumes that new technology can actually help achieve ideal dreams, whether these ideas are about creating peace, harmony, liberation, or democracy. It renders technology as a neutral, as pure means that can achieve these goals. And there's a third discursive approach to the interaction of, of communication with technology and the movements, which advances social me media or the internet as public sphere. Rooted in Hannah Arendt's notion of de democracy as people's capacity to produce politically collective and deliberative spaces, and Jürgen Habermas's conceptualization of the public sphere, which likewise posits a parsimonary model of democracy, the public sphere model of technology constructs cyberspace as a new participatory space. The proponents of this model put forward social media as the new public spheres in the region, which would presumably lead to a process of democratization that has not been very familiar in the past. These different models, the transcendence, the network, the public sphere, are based on different theories and diverse ways of understanding new communication technologies and their role in enhancing political change. However, technological utopianism is actually visible across them. This utopianism, though, comes in different disguises. The, the, the utopia of imagining transcendence, the utopia of imagining renewal of older democratic modes of attached to the public sphere, and the utopian community-centered notion of network. Discussions guided by these mo models arguably have been steered by technological utopianism in the West and actual occurrences in the region. They form a debate, but within the familiar terms of technological utopianism, reflected more of the West and its categories of knowledge than of MENA. Categories such as the network and the public sphere, for example, are embedded in Western common sense, especially in the intellectual domain of how reality and technology can be viewed. While many expert discussions informed by these models tend to investigate men of politics, they, they ir ironically proffer a vision that's adverse to politics. Since the political movements in these discussions are embedded into the workings of technology, not vice versa, they tend to sideline 
menace indigenous knowledge, powers, and replace them with the assumption that it's possible to go into better political conditions with the use of technology. So technological utopianism delimits the recognitions of local politics, historical resources, and material actions, and shifted attention away from complexities that inhere within the region. Here I find it important to put a different communicative imaginary to bear on the MENA movements. I try to contribute to this discussion by focusing on the case of satire in the Egyptian January 25 revolution and tracing it to another revolutionary moment in the history of Egypt. This imaginary involves satire, a strand of non-utopian political discourse. It's a humble attempt, actually, in my side, to tackle a complex and multi-layered event as that of Egypt's January 25. But the purpose is far from providing an all-encompassing description and an account of the movement. Rather, it's to shed light on how political, historical, artistic forms of expression, such as that of satire, can be affected encountering the logic of technological utopianism by prioritizing the history and local resources over modern tools. So in discussions surrounding the Egyptian movement, there's much focus on the role of the Facebook page. For example, we are Khalid Said in fueling the protest. However, not very conspicuous in these discussions is the analysis of satire, the oldest trend of politics in mediating the movement. To elucidate this connection between politics and satire, in the case of the Egyptian movement, we need to go back in history to the end of 19th century when the Arabi Revolution happened. The Arabi Revolution was led by and named for Colonel Ahmed Arabi and is sought to, and is sought to depose uh, the Khedewi Tawfiq Basha and end British and, and uh, French influence over Egypt. Ahmed Arabi led thousands of protesters and soldiers at Tawfiq's palace and dethroned the Khadawi and ruled in his place. One of the elements that contributed to the development of this revolution was satire. I'll refer her here specifically to the work done by two famous literary figures, Yaqub Sanyu and Abdullah Nadim. Sati satirical pieces done by both, Zajal, which is a traditional kind of half poetic form, in the case of Abdullah Nadim, and cartoons in the case of Yaqub Sanyu, played a significant role in, countering, in, in creating counter-hegemonic atmosphere that allowed Egyptians to question and securitize authority. So Yaqub Sanu satirized Egypt's political and economic conditions under the Khadewi Ismail, the father of Khadewi Tawfiq, in a series of cartoons ridiculing, ridiculing the Khadewi. The entertainment and novelty aspects of these cartoons mm -hmm. made them very popular and here's how, Sa uh, how Sanyar defined his work and his journal, which is, by the way, didn't stick to one name. It was named Abu Nadara Zarqa, uh, the man with blue glasses, Abu Safara, the man with the flute, and then Abu Zamara, the Latin player. The reason for this failure is to escape uh, Khadawi's uh, uh, surveillance system. So here's, it says, humorous weekly magazine for the entertainment of the Egyptian youth. Maybe may the Lord of creation mm. save them from the pharaonic founder, which is uh, the pharaonic founder is the Khadawi. Its founder, which is the founder of the journal, is a lover of independence and freedom. And here we can notice two registers. One involves humor and parody, as in the phrase the pharaonic founder of Egypt, referring to the Khadawi. But the other tone is revolutionary. It's, it's kind of serious and formal. And look, let's look at one of his cartoons, the Dequiring Khidewi uh, Ismail. So the cartoon depicts large Khidewi Ismail at the center with a thin man on his left. The man represents the Egyptian citizen and uh, the minister on the right here holding uh, a basket full of fruit and drinks. And this is what is written here under uh, these characters. So the comment under the frail looking guy, oh Muslims, the man is dying of hunger and his oppressor, which is Ismail, is getting fatter. So this is a comment, it's not, a, it's not something that he's saying. And then the Khadawi is saying, my, my dear minister, I'm afraid that these people will defeat us and then I might lose all of the weight that I gained <laughs> from eating pork and drinking alcohol. <laughs> Notice here that reference to pork and alcohol is a kind of resistance to increasing European modernist influence, which the, the Khadawi Ismail represented. The minister replied, 
oh, don't worry, they're all in my pocket, which means under my control, which means um, just, be, just stay behind me, master, and don't worry, we will get the freshest, most delicious foods and drinks, and your personal savings are in excess as always. <coughs> Along with the publication of Abu Nadara journal, there was another journal titled at Tenkit with Takit, Humor and Criticism, a, a weekly traditional journal, a, a weekly, sorry, a satirical journal published by Abdullah Nadim, which was subtitled as this literary satirical national weekly newspaper. Unlike Abu Nadara, uh, um, Abdullah Nadim did not include any cartoons. It relied on Zajal, and jokes, theatrical dialogues, which were intended to comment on Egypt's deteriorating econo economic situation. The journal had a significant social effect as well, and played a key role in garnering mass support for the Arabi revolution to the degree that Nadim was called the orator, the orator of the revolution. His writings and speeches incited people actually to rise and revolt. And there's a little piece here in this journal, and um, I want to read it to give you a kind of sense of what's in there. This excerpt said, Water accumulated in one of the streets of the town, obstructing the traffic of the people. Thus the mayor ordered a committee to be formed in order to investigate. So he's, ta he's talking about time, town J, or so imaginary town, to investigate the issue of this road. After the investigation, the decision was issued. Boats have to be used in order to transport people. So the, people, the, the piece is making fun of how the state can't handle the situation efficiently, how they don't have long uh, long vision or they, they rely on short vision solutions rather than um, doing um, deep uh, deep uh, kind of engagement we would have and that understood that kind of uh, can I describe like major transformation the solution that they presented always simple only just to satisfy people for a long a few or short term rather than caring re really about the situation and the welfare of the people. Referring to this history is to prove this solid and strong connection between political change and satire in the history of Egypt. Actually, we can use satire as an entrance to produce a narrative of January 25 that's distinct from the point of departure initiated in technological utopian discourses. In 2008, Al Kushari Today was founded. Its aim was not to relay reliable information though the front may be kind of uh, right. <laughs> deceiving. The website is named after the common Egyptian dish, kushari, which is consisting of pasta and lentils and rice, and has published stories that's received huge attention prior and during the 25 January revolution, such as this story. The story draws attention to the lack of, like here, this one, author authorities announce Egypt's first transparent election, obviously, it mocks the situation of election in Egypt and it draws attention to the lack of, of transparency. <laughs> and then this one was published after um, the protest um, in 2011. And it says here, <laughs> Egyptian State TV nominated for Oscar. Which means that basically they live their own reality, that um, they, they produce narratives completely different from what was happening on the street. There's another moment when state television accused protesters of being foreign agents and being paid by outside agency. State media actually mentioned protesters had meal from Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Eating from Kentucky is typically equal to one day payment in Egypt. So when protesters were seen eating Kentucky, it was used as a chance to counter the credibility of the demonstrators. In reaction to this claim, protest, uh, you know, so that there is this claim on the state TV, and protesters reacted with these signs. So here's one. The sign basically says, the new leaf combo from Kentucky. <laughs> and here is another one, which is, says, I'm fed up with Kentucky. I won't meet. <laughs> and then there's this one, which of course shows it as Colin Sanders. And it says here, Beltaga, which means thugness, tyranny. <laughs> Um, that's the, the symbol of the, of the poster here. And finally, just to make the point more clear, I would bring the examples of how protesters use satire to convey their main demand at that time, which is the end of the regime. And this de demand actually was imbued with humor. Um, so 
there's this sign, which is <laughs> Antique Dictator um, SL. And this is shows Hasni Mubarak and the exit sign. Mm -hmm. And game over, Mubarak. <coughs> and there's the shoe on his face, which means, I mean, it's a kind of a humiliation. I, I don't know if you remember when Bush was thrown with a shoe. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of, it, it repeats the same message. So I reiterated this, that this project doesn't aim to build a framework of understanding all men of movements or understanding Egypt 25, but it's more to challenge academic efforts that exclude cultural memory, history, and local resources in defining the communicative aspect of the Arab movements. It's an attempt to draw attention to how can we use um, a different imaginary by interpreting the events. I hope that this kind of work is expanded by myself or others. Of course, there are admirable works that have touched um, <coughs> our aesthetic, political, and historical <coughs> facets of Mina, and I was uh, happy to see what Juan created presentation today. I think it touched on this. But I argue that there should be more efforts to disturb along the, uh, the technological <coughs> and the narratives of the region. And thank you. I should have mentioned at the beginning uh, that uh, Dada is uh, doing her PhD at Carlton <laughs> in Tour. Uh, and I imagine you must be working with Kareem H. Kareem. Uh, no. <coughs> no when I came uh, to the department, he was uh, on sabbatical. Uh -huh. But I wanted him. Oh, <laughs> anyway, but we have good links with Carlton <laughs> yeah. as a result of, of that. So um, I think it's not going to be very difficult to establish comparative links and, and comparisons yeah. um, between the Pakistan and the Egyptian <coughs> situations, and no doubt the situation in, in this country or mm -hmm. other countries where satire is such an effective way of uh, people being able to express, sometimes in a safe environment, sometimes in a not so safe environment, the, uh, the, the views that they, that they mm -hmm. hold. One obviously thinks of private eye and nobody's going to go out on the streets to, mm. to burn down private eye because of its comments about David Cameron or whoever. Mm. And yet at the same time one can read uh, everything from the diary of Mrs. Wilson onwards um, mm -hmm. and get some insights into um, the uh, human failing, should we say, of our, of our leaders. Mm. Um, i just uh, kick off uh, while people have also any questions. Um, I, mean, I think uh, you mentioned traditional satire as something that uh, weddings and people mm -hmm. would come. And is there a, a, a comparable tradition in, in Egypt of um, yes. uh, people uh, mm -hmm. in, in a, uh, not in written form, but in mm -hmm. simply um, performing uh, yeah. satire? I think, um, mm -hmm. I think, yes, I mean, that's, um, yeah. I don't know if it's kind of a formal, uh, I mean, is it something that's to be done, but I think it's part of, uh, of how they perform, of how they deliver. I think that when the protesters were using it, it, it you know, it, I mean, they didn't strategically probably use it at that time, but mm -hmm. it's part of who they are, but it was effective in creating this um, environment, this safe environment mm -hmm. that uh, make, it empowers them against the state. Um, so, um, uh, of course, it is part of, of it's a traditional, of course, uh, I think it's also <coughs> an aspect of oral culture. Mm. <coughs> now there are few because the television is taken over. But before we had television, <coughs> there were also entertainment. Yes. Um, so they were, so <coughs> they were, and they were slightly different to traditional storytellers. Mm -hmm. But they were sort of storytellers. They were poets. They were sort of bards. They were, and then bhans were another aspect of the same sort of tradition. Mm -hmm. um, but they were, um, they relied entirely on satire. And also they would mock the people who, whose home they were performing. You know, it's just all part mm. of the thing. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. So, please. When you said that um, the Pakistani army is much like the Egyptian army, uh, when Morsi was in power, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, democratically elected president, <laughs> and there was this um, uh, Basim Yusuf's program, you know, um, who, who basically took the piss out of the brotherhood and the, and, and the president. Mm. And Pakistan invited Morsi to grant him an honorary <laughs> doctorate degree for, <laughs> I don't know what exactly, but anyway, it didn't matter. And, and, and. Um, I remember that episode. Oh my God, it was hysterical. They, they made him wear this weird. Um, in Pakistan. In Pakistan. Oh my God. It's, it's an obscure, it's a hat, a kind of another hat. No, it's obscure university. It's not like you know, I don't know, 
Yeah. I, I bet they wouldn't ever do that to one of their own satirists. A big name. No, 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 not, not that's the news of no. Morsi, the president. To he the was president. invited to, oh, okay, okay. yeah, and, 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 and they made him wear this um, weird hat. Mm -hmm. And then they created this humongous mm -hmm. hat where you could only <laughs> see, like, you know, it, it was hysterical. But then th they started also cracking jokes about Pakistan and the Pakistani army, you know. Mm -hmm. You know the saying that... Uh, the Pakistani army uh, is an army with a state. Mm. Yes. Mm. So yes, of yes, course, you know, country, e yes. Egypt was different. Yes. Um, our army is, is yes. Yes. you know, like, yeah. So just. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. always very easy to laugh at other people or to sort of sympathize with other people, or, you know, but harder to reflect on yourself. Mm. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah, thank you very much for your very. Uh, sorry, could I say. Um, uh, people at the back, please speak up as okay. far as possible so it's picked up by the microphone. Yeah, thank you very much for your papers. I really enjoyed them. I'm, I'm wondering, <coughs> um, having also lived in a country where it's not easy to voice things and certainly satire, um, I know that there are ways of ut using metaphors <coughs> which are kind of in the society vocabulary. Mm. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Do we have ex um, do we have examples of that? I mean, you don't have to tell an example, but um, is that also a way of getting a message message across? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of examples where you mean to escape the kind of the uh, directness, mm. the directness of it, um, and so that you leave enough um, mm. uh, space. Space for interpretation, mm -hmm. and that you can't be tackled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, should I go first? Yeah, go okay. In Pakistan, there's a there's a very famous saying, and there's also a poem, and people sing this, and it's a. Um, I'm sure it's the same in, in Arabic countries, uh, Arab countries where um, poetry is set to music, and and um, it becomes a part of people's lives, not through reading it, but through hearing it. Um, so there's this um, very famous. I think it's a poem called the first lines are Ye sab tera karam hai aaka, ke baad mm -hmm. ab bani hui. Mm -hmm. It means um, thank you Lord it is all you're doing that things are still prospering mm -hmm. and people put this up <laughs> also as you know when things are really <laughs> awful <laughs> so they say Ye sab tera karam hai aaka, ke baad ab you know and everything is falling apart and you can see it but you know they'll just put but nobody can object to it right because yeah. it's a yeah. Um, use of pun. Yeah, it's a pun, and it's also ridiculing the, the distance between actually what is being said and what is being done, mm. um, but without actually saying anything. Yeah. Um, mm. So that's that's how they do it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think of clear examples, but I think satire is based on this indirectness. Um, I mean, many people. Uh, I mean, all these signs, although they were provocative, but there are kind of hidden messages that you know they wouldn't be it would be hard to deliver. Mm. So, um, as for example, when they were uh, talking about uh, Oscar for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the media, I mean, it's instead of saying that we don't have elections that are transparent and saying it in clear terms and discussing it, they were trying to find a way to, to make fun of it, but at the same time not as direct <coughs> and it wouldn't be accepted as, um, you know, in other situations, probably it would be seen as oppositional, as dangerous, as as. as but in this case, it's it's just fun. It's humor, and there are the messages is um, underneath. So I think it's satire, satire, in a way, based on this hiddenness and and symbols. I mean, many of things that are inside one poster probably wouldn't work in another environment, in another culture, because it has its own significance in that culture. Um, yeah, I can see it in other ways. Well, just have a quick question. Thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, my question to Rada. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Yeah, uh, just uh, you started. You started with Orabi uh, 1882 and then ended with uh, 21st of January. Mm -hmm. And you skipped uh, some period sure. where 
poetry was very significant. Like mm -hmm. Berman Tomsi was really strong uh, uh, against the government using poetry. Mm -hmm. And between 2006, during even Mubarak, 2006 up to 2010, 2006, 2008, the independent at the store yeah. uh, by Ibrahim Isa, they had a significant section using cartoon oh. to, uh, oppose, uh, to oppose to uh, oppose Mubarak regime. And they stopped, of course, they stopped, they stopped the the independent newspaper after two years. But they at least they had some significant uh, uh, cartoons against Mubarak at that time. Is there any particular reason that you skipped this video? Uh, actually, no, because uh, this is this is not my project. Uh, when I was um, like in my PhD, I'm more of focusing on technological utopianism, more of communication technology theories. And then I was working on okay, how can we create alternative stories? And Looking at the history of Egypt, I mean, I think what's interesting is that if this is not 10 years ago. This is more than 100 years ago. So it's something that I want to say the opposite of what I am critiquing. That's something that's very, very historically rooted in the culture. It's not something that's been developed lately, but it's something that we can see it in the older history of Egypt. So I think the historical part of it, um, I mean, I know that that's history as well, mm. but I'm looking more of, of of uh, revolutions that went against the colonialism and against the Khadawi. Um, I think it it's proves the point that satire is essential to the history of movements in Egypt. I, uh, but of course, uh, part of my ignorance, I'm, I'm new to the project, and, uh, and I mean, this is not my field as well, but uh, I mean, not my, the, the idea of satire and that. But I think it's, it's to, to show um, yeah, to to produce something that's yeah, but you could link it to uh, the oral tradition as well. During mm. the uh, uh, it, before 1952, the revolution uh, by the army or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, there was something in downtown called the Madhakhana, and it's simply okay. a cafe where all jokers gather together and <laughs> distribute jokes against the the government, the king before the revolution, and then during Nasser even they used to gather and just distribute jokes against the politics of the country and the government and so on and so forth. This is interesting because this is also not traditional journalism, but more of, uh, you know, yeah. in, in, is it kind of a club or a coffee shop? No, it's places? just a cafe, <laughs> cafe in, near okay. downtown and uh, they used to call it a Madhak Khana. Okay. Yeah, Dabal Khal, yeah, it's in Dabal Khal. Um, and madhak kana, you know the word madhak means it uh, makes people <laughs> laugh. Yeah. So it's uh, it's the place where they can make people laugh. Mm -hmm. But basically, they used to distribute jokes, uh, political jokes, and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. That was like kind of uh, mass media uh, mm -hmm. in its own. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. There is a uh, thing no. attributed to Nasser. I'm sorry, I just want yeah. to uh, uh, attributed to Nasser uh, that he said that when the Egyptians stopped joking. Hmm. And making political jokes, it's dangerous. They will revolt mm -hmm. when they stop the joke. When they stop joking, so okay. it, it, it's been known that the Egyptians laugh at themselves and and their situation all the time because it's a valve. Okay. So there, <laughs> it, it, I, I don't remember the title, but maybe Walid can help me. Sorry, take We've been taken over by the, the Egyptians. There was a. a, 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 a actually um, um, assigned to collect the jokes mm -hmm. and they would tell them to Nasser every week mm -hmm. so that he'd be you know reassured that the Egyptians were still joking I was not just a question uh, the question is for you but I just I want to elaborate on this topic just mm -hmm. this whole thing mm -hmm. I think we can trade this back to the maybe the Mamluk period or before because oh. we have like a uh, text that uh, in the, even the Mamluk period uh, people when they protested they used to you know insult and say also Zajal and this uh, oh. poetry to, to <laughs> yes to the Mamluks okay. and uh, we have representations maybe from the Roman period in Egypt in the museums mm -hmm. and uh, they like to present the uh, depict um, a mouse and a cat and try to you know send a message by them so I think in Egypt it's really so uh, deep. Oh. Actually uh, as a comment is that that uh, the oldest um, the oldest satire that existed was in 
in the Pharaoh period. Yeah, I know that. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's yeah. where it started, that concept it's started. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, now we'll come, I'll come back to you, Ali, but not just. I have just a small question, but this, this was a comment. Although Egypt is uh, somehow maybe a conservative society, uh, however, in, in the revolution, they used some, you know, they crossed the line, they used some insults in order to, you know, like, uh, a critique or criticize the, the, the regime in Egypt. So in Pakistan, it, does this happen? Or so you use the insults too? Like to protest against the regime, against mm -hmm. the Mubarak, against the Fulham mm -hmm. uh, and so mm -hmm. So did it happen in, in, in Pakistan? Because it, the Pakistani society for me is a bit, you know, ambiguous. Yeah, uh, uh, it's for me as well. You know, there's a very famous saying about the Punjab. Um, <coughs> Punjab is Pakistan's most populous and biggest province. And um, as you know, when, uh, Pakistan was part of India before um, 1947. <coughs> and um, all invaders who came through the Hindu Kush and then down, they all came first through Punjab. Mm -hmm. And then they went into the rest of India. So every 50, 100 years, Lahore was destroyed. By, you know, and they all came in through there, destroyed it, killed everybody who, who uh, opposed them. <coughs> and then um, went on towards Delhi. And often the, um, the kings would not, uh, the rulers of the time, would not engage with them in, in the Punjab. They would wait until they came nearer to Delhi, and then they would fight them. Mm. And sometimes they lost the battle, but most often they didn't. And, th and then these invaders would have to go back through the Punjab. <laughs> so over a period of years, I think, I mean, I read this in a, in a book, the, 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 the history book written by a, a, a bureaucrat who served in the Punjab for a long time. And he said that um, the Punjabis have evolved a particular kind of uh, um, characteristic and nature to deal with this sort of constant, you know. So when they are being invaded, they've stopped fighting. Now they just do salam and they say, please, please, <laughs> they just take the treasury and just please go. But when the, the invaders have lost and they're coming back, at that point, the Punjabi, when he sees that there is no um, real threat anymore, then they fall upon them. <laughs> and they sort of, you know. So, um, you know, in, in Pakistan, there is always a great um, sort of respect in some ways for authority. And because the, the one thing I want to say to you about the army in Pakistan is that because they have used the curriculum, they've changed the curriculum. Um, mm -hmm to aggrandize themselves constantly, mm -hmm. to talk about what fine soldiers they are. They are guardians of Pakistan. They are the, the, mm -hmm. they are the people who guarantee the, um, the national um, custodians, the custodians and, and, and the national integrity of the country. Mm -hmm. And where if they, and you know, they're never asleep, they're always awake, oh. and they're always sort of watching out for you, and they're always, and children, you know, read this from the time they're about three to the time they come out of school at the age of, 18 or 17 or whatever and so this is kind of um, drilled into them and then you also have the newspapers and the, the television channels which are constantly um, out of fear and also out of out of uh, um, bribery I guess they are uh, being um, th they, they repeat the same thing so in fact the people of Pakistan you know you were saying to the South the army they adore the army mm -hmm. um, they, they hate the, the uh, elected democratic <laughs> representa uh, rep representatives, but uh, they have a great deal of admiration and respect and, and um, love for the army. Um, and if you ever actually speak out against the army, people will get angry with you. There's a difference now between the religious establishment and the army. They, they some feel they're afraid of the religious establishment, but they love the army. Mm. Although, as you say, individual generals can be singled out, but not the Yes, yes. And also, it's interestingly, you know, when, when, when um, they didn't take offense to General Zia being lampooned in uh, a case of exploding mangoes because General Zia had long since gone. So, like the Punjabis, sort of, you know, uh, making fun of somebody who's no longer a threat. Mm -hmm. um, then you can make fun of them as much as you want because he's no longer there. And the Pakistan army, which was under General Zia, is different to the Pakistani army under General uh, Kiani. So, he can let it pass. <laughs> right. No, no. Now I really am coming to Najam. Uh, um, uh, I wish to prod deeper into uh, the reasons that you mentioned transcendence, network, and public sphere. 
and put them as utopian notions. <clears throat> Do you think that now scholars and researchers are looking at, a, is, it's a part of a reflection or retrospection uh, about whether the Maidan Tahrir was about the moment or about the people or about the episode because if uh, the Egyptian people uh, had some aspirations and they could or they couldn't uh, uh, reach th those aspirations so do you think that uh, there has been uh, episodes of fascination fetish or fantasy where it was portrayed as the, or it was heralded as captive people liberated by Twitter or social media mm -hmm. rather than uh, other factors of mobilization. So can you expand on your notion, uh, utopian notions of mm -hmm. transcendence and public sphere mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the narrative uh, which puts a focus on social media rather than the public mobilization of non-traditional, non-technological, but conventional uh, factors of mobilization. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think it's, it's important to address it because there are two aspects to it. First of all, what is a revolution? I mean, I think the common understanding of a revolution, which is based on a Western understanding of a revolution, it should be short, it should be transitional, people moving from one state to another, um, it should bring ideal conditions to people, so that's democracy, freedom, liberation. And if we think about revolution in that terms, then uh, what happened in Egypt would fit exactly in the ideal of the revolution. But I think that what it needs to revisit the notion of the revolution itself as something that doesn't happen over five years or ten years, even. I mean, it's, it could be longer than that, maybe 100 years. And I think uh, um, William Raymond, uh, he talked about the long revolution in Britain, uh, the cultural revolution. So first revisiting the concept of revolution and whether we describe events as what happened in Egypt as a revolution. And if we describe it as a revolution, do we have to, because if we think about revolution as moving to a happier state, then when something doesn't turn as good as we wish, we kind of go and be pessimistic, which is, that's what happened, is that the pendulum is that from being very optimistic to very uh, pessimistic, which created concepts like um, uh, the Arab fall or the, because, because of as a reaction to the older uh, narrative about the, uh, the, the utopian notion of it. And the second thing is that this concept of technology, for example, as transcendence. Transcendence as a concept is something um, part of the Western culture. I mean, if we look at um, uh, if we look at older utopias, it's, it's based on this concept of notion. If we look at the network, um, uh, Western philosophers as Saint Simon, as, um, as many other as, as sociologists, I mean, they build their ideal cities upon the structure of the network. And it's the same thing with a sphere. So um, these notions, I think, they're borrowed from the Western literature, from the Western culture, and that they are imposed on, on, different, um, uh, on different geographical space. Um, it doesn't accommodate uh, hybridity of space. It doesn't accommodate hybridity of times. Um, so that's why it leads to deterministic accounts of what happened. Um, as something utopian and um, uh, yeah as, as a narrative that I think that it's misleading and misleaded in some way okay uh, we'll come to you. Uh, first of all uh, Saima and then David yeah. uh, one is just an observation um, and I'd like to know your thoughts on it whether um, it is true um, that in Pakistan <coughs> in the last 10 years or maybe in the last 15 years now there's been more of a relaxed approach towards making fun of politicians on media. Because um, when we just had the national television, predominantly that's what people watched about 20 years ago, um, 
it was very it was done in a very limited way mm -hmm. and we saw very little of um, committing you know, anyone ridiculing politicians mm -hmm. but now it's very common and yeah. kind of acceptable yeah so with the rise of private channels yeah um, now the big media houses control the channels so <coughs> and also corporate interests um, and they're always on the side of the army and not not always on the side of the army but uh, quite a few of them on the side of the army, and the, and because the politicians don't really have that much power, they're very useful punching bags. <laughs> um, so the whole time they're making fun of the politicians, um, but never really speaking truth to power. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, there's just one exception. You're asking me if they ever make fun, if they ever insult um, <coughs> real power holders. The only time I remember. In my sort of, uh, apart from the, the cartoonists who are quite sort of fearless and wonderful, and also these young uh, people on, on social media. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I remember um, soon after, you must have been a very brave man, but soon after um, Osama bin Laden was found in Pakistan, um, and the Americans came and whipped him out, and you know, it was all in the backyard of the army. This was Aptabad, which was the um, 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 military academy. Military, mm. not military academy, but also where all the retired generals live, and it's a sort of you know, they had the um, the Kakul sort of center was every any. So he was found basically really in the backyard <coughs> of the army, and they came, they took him out. It took long, op it was quite a long operation, and nobody knew about it. You know, they were all they slept through the whole thing, mm. and um, I remember um, there was a um, little rickshaw driver which was sort of going around the little um, three wheeled vehicle. I think in, in Bangkok they are called tuk tuks. Mm -hmm. And in Pakistan they are called rickshaw. And there was a sign at the back which said, please don't honk loudly, the Pakistan army is asleep. <laughs> 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 and, and that was the only one I'd ever seen actually, which was at that time. Then. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so I answered your question. Yes. Okay. Yeah. First of all, David Deleish. David Deleish, uh, very interested in your talk. Yes. I mean, during the time of Zia or Huck, I've been talking about um, people making fun of the army. There were, people did make huge numbers of jokes about Zia or Huck. Yes. Until he hanged Puto. Yes. And I think after that, people said, you know, there weren't so many jokes. Yes. Um, <laughs> because, you know, yes. the situation changed. I mean, are you saying that uh, people, you know, don't make jokes about the army or the Buddha? They do, they do, but in private, I think it's, it's some, you don't do it on national television in Urdu. Mm -hmm. No. Um, it's it's uh, and and you know I think um, in the last few years as their relationship with America has deteriorated a little, they become more prickly still. So mm -hmm. up until the 1970s, <coughs> I remember 70s, 80s, people used to write poetry against them, people would joke about them, people could because remember in the 70s it was actually um, the army had been humiliated in 1971 yeah. in in um, uh, Bangladesh, mm -hmm. and so it wasn't in a position to. Um, um, Asserted. Asserted itself, mm -hmm. and at that time, after that, Bhutto came to power, and um, Bhutto was sort of a proper sort of autocrat. Um, you couldn't make fun of Bhutto, but you couldn't make fun of the army. But then the army recovered, mm -hmm. and uh, since the sort of 90s and and um, um, the Afghan war and all of that, and the 1980s, it is still there was a little bit more space, but over the time, space has been shrinking, mm -hmm. um, and um, now they take themselves very very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, I remember. <laughs> seeing a photograph um, of General Zia, um, you know, when, when he used to go off on his very many hajjis, um, when he used to come back, there were little children waiting at the airport with flowers to present him. And there's this one photograph in which he picks up this little girl who's presenting him with a, with a bouquet of roses. And, and there was a gust of wind, and her dress flew up. And you could see that she, you know, he had his hands around her, uh, her legs, particularly around her thighs, and his fingers were kind of digging in. And he's smiling at the camera, above, <laughs> and underneath it said, "General Zia, fondless little girl." <laughs> it was, you know, and it was. If you didn't pick up the subtext, it was a sort of harmless thing. But you know, at that time, these things could pass. Mm. Um, and there used to be jokes about his wife. There used yeah. to be jokes about him. Um, but uh, can't now. Actually, I mean. Uh, there is more of a need for satire of both the army and the bullets now than there has ever been. Yes, yes, but the stakes are higher as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. in social media, I mean, in, in you know, at that time, sorry, excuse me, I think that the difference was that at that time, um, you didn't have so many non-state actors. Yeah. What you're really frightened of now, 
other non-state actors. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, there's been a proliferation of, of really um, militant, extremist sort of bodies who are answerable to nobody, mm. uh, who appear to be answerable to nobody. Very ironical because everybody is saying, of course, Pakistan, 70 media, 70 television stations, 70 radio stations, mm. far more than they used to be. And yeah. yet, uh, somehow, this has not led to any uh, critical kind of approach. It has as well. It has. It has. And, and I was saying, and I'm talking about um, uh, mockery, which is a different thing. Um, it has led to serious uh, debate. It has. There are lots. I mean, Pakistan's, I think, main entertainment is. Um, talk shows, uh, which are sort of on a loop, round the clock, um, and uh, it's astonishing the kind of sort of abuse which goes on, the kind of incitement to violence that goes on on the television. I, fi- I find it quite sort of um, dispiriting, but <coughs> within that also, people do speak their minds, people do mm-hmm. talk, people do express differences of opinion. Um, you always have to be a little guarded, a little careful, but people do speak out. Mm-hmm. And, and, and many of the talk shows are hard-hitting, um, are truthful, are um, very courageous. Mm. Okay. Aisha. Um, this is actually a follow-up to what you just said, but there are moments in time where anti-military opinions become stronger, such yeah. as obviously the Osama bin Laden yeah. incident, yeah. and then so, uh, right after Sabine Mahmoud's death, um, where it was just sort of ISI was blamed. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think the social media gives uh, these anti-military sort of later yes. opinions a place, a safe place? To yes, yes. Um, yes. Any opinions views. like YouTube and Twitter, Absolutely. Facebook pages. Absolutely. What's your opinion so on that? Because I do know that's all monitored. But yes, I. Now, what is very interesting is that you know when I was talking about um, the the film on YouTube, The Innocence of Muslims. Immediately after that, um, using citing that as as the main uh, reason. Pakistan closed down YouTube. Uh, the, the, the government closed down YouTube. And I think it was only restarted in January 2016. Yeah. So it was closed in October 2012 and up until 2016. It was, you know, we're not allowed to use it. Now, uh, of course, that was his main reason, but also you shut down all the other sort of jokers on, tele- uh, on, on YouTube making, you know, home films and make, mocking the army or mocking, you know, whatever. So it was a useful way of shutting down a whole lot of debate. Um, on social media, now, they've been very good at trying to control, uh, and succeeding, um, uh, control over newspapers and television channels, terrestrial television channels, as well as satellite television channels and sort of radio. But they can't control social media. That's beyond them. And also because so many people are anonymous and they can make fun of you, on the, and then there are lots of commentary, etc. Now, recently, there was a very interesting case. Um, a journalist from Dawn newspaper reported <coughs> that there had been a high level meeting, a secret meeting between um, the chief ministers and the prime minister and um, the, I think the uh, minister of interior and the foreign minister and also uh, the sort of core commanders and ISI people. Not all the core commanders but some high ranking generals and ISI people. And According to the journalist, he, he, he said that um, th- somebody leaked this information to this journalist that in that meeting, the, uh, the civilians told the armed forces that we have to rein in, you have to rein in all these non-state actors, mm. the extremists. You remember recently there was an attack in India and mm. the Indians blamed Pakistanis. Mm. Uh, 17, I think, uh, uh, Indian soldiers were killed in that attack, and they said that there were um, um, uh, jihadists who come across the border. And they said, Pakistani said, we have nothing to do with this. We don't know what you're talking about. Um, and so um, <coughs> they said that you know we've got to st- we've got to stop this because otherwise we face social isolation, you know, sort of diplomatic isolation from the rest of the world community. And they reported this, this, and the army he reported this, and the army reacted very badly to it and <coughs> wanted to know who the leak was. They wanted 
sort of um, <coughs> the scalp of the man who had leaked it. They also wanted the journalist to suffer. They also wanted um, him to, so he was, immediately the DA minister put him down on the exit control list so he could not leave the country. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, um, the government got, obviously the army leaned on the government, the government got very frightened and the government said, of no such conversation took place, we don't know what they're talking about, and of, we don't know what, who the leak was, we don't know, because no such conversation took place, so how could a leak have happened, and blah, blah, blah. And um, in the past, they would have been able to shut down that whole thing. Mm -hmm. But because of social media, the story was picked up, and within two days, it was in The Guardian, it was in the BBC, it was in New York Times, and what should have actually been a very small, you know, a, a, a contained thing became hugely spread out. And that is how social media works these days. You know, people shared it on Facebook, people just sent it out on Twitter, you know, links to the story, and it spread like wildfire. Um, so this is where the Pakistan um, state, um, the establishment, cannot control social media. Um, thank you very much for both your talks. I had a question on satire, both from Gadi, your perspective and studying it in the Egyptian context, and your perspective as a satirist. Um, uh, there's nothing more funny than, uh, or more tempting a target, I think, than um, things that are considered to be taboo mm -hmm. or people who don't know how to take a joke. Mm -hmm. And but, but both of those instances are also ones that are fraught with danger. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, from the perspective of Egypt and your work, um, in the field, uh, how have you known where to draw that line mm -hmm. in, in, against what is clearly off limits mm -hmm. to even a satirist, but then also in Egypt's perspective and in this context you're looking at, where were those lines drawn in terms of what was allowed to be satire and what was off limits? Um, yes, sir. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, the stories that even that I brought today, um, for example, he he went to a lot of uh, a lot. I mean, he faced a lot as a consequence of what what he did. So it's not. I mean, it has to be with danger. Um, it's it's. I don't think it's um, escapable. Um, um, and it depends on. <coughs> I mean, there are kinds of satire that. I mean, Basim Yusuf is a satirist. And what happened to him is not probably not as, as bad as you think, but still he's he's not working and he, and he had to move to US. So that's another net. So I don't think danger can be escaped by using satire. Um, it's part of the of the experience for many who did that, especially those who were to the point. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about the experience of somebody who's engaged yeah. really with that. Um, I think it's, it's part of it. I think, yeah, I mean, danger is part of it. Um, but uh, in Pakistan, I mean, because I had uh, an editor who was quite careful, I was schooled fairly earlier. Mm. So um, it was about, um, you can make fun of people, <coughs> but you can't make fun of, um, That's right, yeah. you can't make fun of the country, you can't make fun of uh, the religion, you can't make fun of things like that. Um, and actually, basically, what you do want to make fun of are the people, really, mm -hmm. you know, it's not anything else. But also, um, I mean, <coughs> you know not to make fun of the non-state actors. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's a very clear thing. Mm -hmm. If you do it, you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a red line, you cross that red line. Um, you don't really make fun of the army as such. You don't make fun of... Uh, you can gently, gently make fun of the main um, mainstream religious leaders, mm -hmm. um, those who are sort of elected and stuff, but in a gentle kind of endearing kind of way, you know, sort of so that you make them feel like they're lovable teddy bears, <laughs> really. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't, you know, it's, it's those okay. are the, so basically you stay away from yeah. those things. This question is to Mooney. It's just an extension of what we were talking about before. Am I correct in saying that the army is disliked in Balochistan and Waziristan? Yes. And if that is the case, can we vocalise our dislike? Or can is they it still uh -huh. it? people of Balochistan? And they do. Mm. They do. Um, and, uh, you know, things are, are pretty bad there. But. Um, I, I don't, uh, I can't speak or read 
Balochi or Brony or the languages they speak there. <coughs> so I um, can't really say, but um, I think there is very strong dissent there, very strong. Um, and I think that they, you know, the more oppressed you are, you know, you mm -hmm. feel that you've got less to lose, mm -hmm. so you can speak more. Yeah, thank you, Moni, for that very insightful discussion. I just had a question about the positioning of these red lines that you talk about. Uh, does that, in your opinion, does that vary based on the language of your medium? I mean, I get the sense that in English, people can get, can get away with more in English. Uh, in English. <laughs> um, and as a follow-up question, which language domain would the generals identify themselves with? Would they sort of sense more affinity with oh, the English-speaking elite, or? Because Urdu is a mass language, you know, it's a language of the people, and um, they they don't. It is a you know you fifty thousand people who, or, or twenty thousand people who read English newspapers or, or um, you know they're not a threat, uh, and they can be bought off as well. You know, so it's not it's not really it's it's, it's when millions of people are watching your program. Um, and, and millions are commenting on it, and then the newspaper and the next day, Urdu is also talking about it, and that's a different thing. So, yeah, Urdu is a, is a, more, mm -hmm. sort of, is a language that they can. I talk. think this is relative to the question that was asked about how range or danger is avoided in the case of satire and yeah. putting it yeah. in another yeah. language. Yeah. It's a way of escaping, but at the same time, you kind of lose of the effect that yeah. you wish to yeah. have because yeah. of the. Yeah, you do not have a mass sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry, excuse me, you just asked one question. Yeah. Uh, I just want to elaborate on that. You know, um, very few newspapers, mm -hmm. very few um, televisions will actually, channels, etc., will talk about uh, what is happening in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. So even if they're talking about it, mm -hmm. it's never aired. So even like the local channels in Bolivia, will they suppress the correct news? I don't know about that, I'm afraid. I don't know about that. Can I? Sorry. Uh, in my humble opinion, as an Egyptian, I want to pick up on the red lines of satire. I think that, um, first of all, uh, satire to a certain extent in Egypt is allowed as to give the people the illusion of having freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Because if you come and think about it, freedom of speech in itself, the concept of freedom of speech has limitations. There is no pure freedom of speech. That's the first thing. And second thing in Egypt, um, because Egypt falls under the, the political spectrum, or actually the spectrum uh, of political system, it doesn't fall under totalitarianism. It falls under authoritarianism, which is uh, midway between democracy and totalitarianism. It's a gray area. Mm -hmm. We do have some sort of freedom of speech because I myself have, um, I, I wrote article previously about the government, mm -hmm. and to a certain extent I was criticizing the injustice uh, between the social classes, and I'm here. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm okay. <laughs> so I think that um, satire, criticism, comments are allowed to a certain extent to give people the illusion that they're mm. free. Mm. Uh, but I think that satire becomes dangerous when this kind of satire is accessible by all social classes. Mm. The thing is, um, before uh, uh, the, in the period of Abu Nadora, I don't think that every Egyptian could read. We still have a high percentage of illiteracy, however, uh, yeah. Now in Egypt, a lot of people can read, and a lot of people can read in English, and a lot of people can read in French. Mm -hmm. So I think that documents and um, news and information are, access are accessible through the internet in many languages, and these languages are accessible by, let's say, the 45% um, <coughs> of the population. Yeah, I I'm not really sure about the percentage, I'm just generalizing or um, mm -hmm. just guessing. But when the satire is bec becomes accessible, to all of the classes, yeah. then it becomes dangerous. Yeah, and the comment on that, uh, actually it was read to people who couldn't read. Mm -hmm. yes. okay. It was, yeah. uh, even the dean's writing was read to people, they would gather and they would read it to them. Yeah. So I think literacy and illiteracy, it's an issue, it's relevant, yeah. but I think it can. Mm -hmm. And I just think one point is that, <laughs> I mean, you said the illusion of freedom of speech. So you, I, what I understand is that, from what you said, is that there is a distinction between freedom of speech and illusion of freedom of speech, which is, uh, I'm not sure if there's really a distinction between the two. I mean, in freedom of speech, like what is real freedom of speech? Um, there was, I think, an interesting panel today about 
head to Charlie Hebdo and they discuss many aspects of it and whether it's with freedom of speech or not or you know it, it, are there limits or not limits and I think this is negotiable in all in many societies um, but I think that whatever can be allowed is good I don't think there's something that can be described as illusion I think it's a step ahead uh, unless we are putting an idealistic picture of freedom of speech, I think, which is not happening in any part of the world. I mean, in, even in many, many Western societies, which have been working on that for a long while. So um, I'm not sure if I agree with the notion of, of illusion, unless you have um, like specific, specific. A definition or meaning of it. I think that illusion is part of it. Uh, I so I so your time now we're coming to the end of our time, but we'll. I've, I've here and here and here. Well, I mean, just there are times when the government of Egypt uh, was uh, more lax with respect to cracking down on speech, and uh, and at other times it's it's, it's uh, much harsher. Mm. So I think this is really, I think maybe what you're hinting at to me, mm. not so much of an illusion, but you know, a kind of a feel, fielding of mm -hmm. of legitimation mm. issues. Mm. That the limits are are still imposed. They are still imposed by more or less at certain moments. Mm -hmm. But if I may add to the, to the to the case of Egypt, satire is even like exercise between. So if you walk on the streets and you go to this kosher on the streets, like it's small mm. kiosks, and like there there are two illiteracy guys, they don't know how to read, mm. and like there is this kind of slang satire between the two of them. It's like yeah. normal thing to see every single day in Cairo. Mm. And sometimes actually the academic researcher they go out on the streets and they start to talk with these people because it's, this is where the original material actually comes from. Mm. Mm. Let's, let's just take the remaining two questions. Um, I, was I, just, I was actually going to build on what she, she's saying. Uh, as far as I know, just from cool. since 2011 until 2013, that was the golden age of satire and uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Before that and after that, we don't have. Uh, we, we, we are now in the illusion. But at the time, we think. And then we've got Jacob at the end. The thing is, simple phrases like cease or easy, which literally means <laughs> cease is my present, <laughs> it's used in, in a C -C sarcastic way. Mm -hmm. And cease or easy, as in my easy. Yeah, since he's my present, but we always say like Cicero Isi, who, who is he? Like <laughs> we, we we tend to use very simple things as um jokes. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Last question. Uh, well, uh, in Egypt, before the revolution, it was quite common for intellectuals to explain that we're making jokes about everything, especially politics, and the government likes it because it's tanfees, as they say, it's letting out steam yes. and and. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not that there was none of it. I I I'm, I don't know how much I believe in this, but the uh, Egyptians were making fun of Hosni Mubarak long before the revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So very good sense of humor. Come on, don't yeah. yeah, that's uh, that's a very good part of it. Mm -hmm. I had the sort of unfortunate experience of being the director of the Danish Institute during the mm. time of the Khartoum crisis. So oh wow! Lecturing oh, yeah. about satire in Egypt and about what is acceptable satire and what is unacceptable satire, <laughs> and going forth and back, I had this ex experience in Denmark that those who defended they said we are attacking an idea, Islam or an ideology, Islam. That's okay, but if you attack persons, we've got laws against this. But we must be able to discuss Islam. Whereas in Egypt, I had to kind of. Uh, Adverse experience of uh, people saying you can attack me as much as you can, but never attack my prophet. Yeah. So there were these very different <coughs> conceptions of what is acceptable satire. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have any last thoughts on the panel? Uh, actually, I've learned a lot from what's been okay. discussed, and uh, you know, you thanks for the questions and the comments. As well. Thank and you very um, much. I think what's come out of it to me, I mean, I think. We all see satire in many circumstances as a safety valve, as a, a covert tool of, of a sensible government that they will leave um, opportunities. I remember also thinking of 19th century uh, quote satirical magazines, that there's even a way of showing affection for people. Caricatures uh, can be affectionate, but they can also be biting and very vicious and, and nasty. And quite where we draw the lines, the red lines that you're talking about, is something that's uh, 
no, we won't get to the end of it because the situation will keep changing, the lines oh, will, will keep changing and uh, some people have to keep up to speed with where those lines are and yeah. make sure they don't step up. Other people can see them as an opportunity, like, as you were saying, right. uh, to try and sort of make just little, little mm. mix, little dents in, mm. in it and uh, hopefully they don't get uh, mm. too, too um, punished as a result. And, uh, that's just the great people and uh, it's good to listen and to talk about uh, that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Thank you. I could just remind people that I think we start at 10 o'clock.